Good afternoon. Vaccines are at the heart of a government strategy to manage COVID-19. As of today, 18,242,873 people have been vaccinated across the United Kingdom and 18,911,978 doses have been given overall. Since yesterday, 9,938 people are reported to have tested positive for coronavirus. As of the 22nd of February 2021, 16,803 people were in hospital with coronavirus. That's down 20% from the week before. And sadly, of those who have tested positive for coronavirus across all settings, 121,747 are reported to have now died. That's an increase of 442 fatalities since yesterday. And our thoughts are very much with the families of those who have lost loved ones to this virus. On Monday, the Prime Minister outlined the roadmap out of lockdown and gave us the news that we've all been waiting for. We can now plan for the return of all pupils to schools and colleges as part of a roadmap for leaving lockdown. I want to say once again a massive thank you to our incredible teachers, leaders, support staff and childcare workers. You have been going above and beyond to keep schools and colleges open for vulnerable children and children of critical workers and to keep the remainder of young people learning when they're at home. I also want to thank parents who've been supporting their children while they learn at home. And I want to thank children and young people themselves for their patience and resilience. I know it hasn't been easy, but you have adapted and done so much to make sure that you've been able to continue to learn. Everyone, everyone is longing for a return to normality. And I want you to know that we're continuing to support schools, colleges and teachers with extra help to boost children's learning. We're investing in a range of options that parents and children will benefit from, whether that's summer schools, extra funding for specialist teaching and expanding our national tutoring programme. As the Prime Minister said, we can now take the next steps. These will be cautious, but that's crucial if we don't want to end up going backwards. So the process we've planned will be carefully managed at every stage. I'm incredibly pleased the latest data tells us that we are able to proceed with a full return of schools and colleges from Monday the 8th of March. As we outlined earlier this week, primary school pupils will return to school on that day, while secondary schools and colleges will be able to stagger their return over that week to ensure all their students can be offered COVID tests. Wraparound childcare, for primary and secondary school pupils will also resume from the 8th of March. University students who are studying practical courses who need specialist facilities can also return to campus from then on too. We'll review the timing for return of the remaining students by the end of the Easter holidays. Despite everyone's best efforts, many children are going to need longer term support if they're to make the edu educational progress that they need. This is why the Prime Minister and myself appointed our Education Recovery Commissioner, Sir Kevin Collins, to advise on how our early year settings, as well as our schools and colleges, can address these learning gaps as quickly and as comprehensively as possible. But because young people just cannot afford to wait, we're putting in place a, a range of immediate measures for schools to start now to recover lost learning. Today, we're announcing the introduction of a new one-off £302 million recovery premium for state primary and secondary schools, building on the pupil premium to further support pupils who need it most. 
We're expanding our successful tutoring programmes. £200 million will fund an extended national tutoring programme for primary and secondary schools. An extension to the 16 to 19 tuition fund to support more students in English, maths and other vocational and academic subjects and funding to support language development in early years children. Finally, £200 million will be available for secondary schools to deliver face-to-face -face summer schools. Schools will be able to target individual pupils' needs. This means that if your child needs extra help, then they are able to get it. For example, a block of tutoring can help a child gain three to five months of catch-up in learning. We know our teachers are best placed to understand what your children will need. So they'll have the tools to deliver that extra boost and make a real difference as we recover from this pandemic. The package announced today will build on the £1 billion catch-up package we announced last June and forms part of a wider response to help pupils make up for the lost learning they've suffered. This isn't just about more money for schools. This is investing in our children. This boost to learning will be assessed and evidence-based and will track the outcomes. The scientific advice does support a full return for schools on the 8th of March. As Professor Chris Whitty said on Monday, the risk to children is incredibly low from going to school and from catching COVID. So everything is strongly in favour of children going to school. We are supporting this return with a robust testing regime. that will be critical in breaking the chains of COVID infection. Four million tests have already been completed across primary, secondary schools and colleges. Staff have worked hard to set up te testing sites in schools and have had time to get used to supervising the testing. We're now expanding asymptomatic testing further and have published full details online. In line with public health guidance, we're also now advising that face coverings should be worn in secondary school classrooms as well as in further and higher education settings, unless social distancing can be maintained. Again, this is to help reduce transmission. The risk to children themselves is incredibly low. This is a temporary measure to support the safe return of schools and will be in place until Easter when it's reviewed. All the other safety measures that are already in place continue to be robust, including bubble groups, staggered starts and staggered finishes, increasing ventilation and strict hygiene measures. The return to school is what we have been looking forward to. It is time for children to be back in school, learning and playing with their friends. But we must also look to the future. No child should have their prospects blighted by the pandemic, and I'm determined that this isn't going to happen. Tomorrow we'll be setting out for details on how grades will be awarded this summer. While I cannot preempt that announcement, I'm very pleased to say that it will confirm that this year we're putting our trust firmly in the hands of teachers. The broad range of catch-up measures we have planned will enable children to start recouping not just the lost learning time, but the fun and friendship that they have missed out so much on. They quite simply deserve no less. I think our whole nation has never before valued what schools and teachers and education bring to all of our children more than it does today. And I think we'll all be so much willing for the successful return of all our children back into school on the 8th of March. Now we're going to have the opportunity to turn to Mark from Yorkshire, who's got the first question. Hello. If decisions are driven by the data, 
and the data is better than expected, will the roadmap out of lockdown be accelerated? Thank you. Well, as the Prime Minister said, that there are no plans whatsoever to uh, be moving ahead of the dates that have already been given. Uh, we want to give uh, public as well as business the confidence and the assurance as to when these next steps are going to be happening, uh, but there are certainly no plans to be uh, moving ahead of that. Uh, Jenny, I'm not sure if there's anything you wanted yes, to add. I, I, probably just to reinforce the fact that the, the timelines have been set for very good public health reasons. We need to be able to see uh, the change in the infection rates, the development of illness, the effect of the vaccine and the effect uh, on hospitalisations in the NHS. Uh, and all of that takes a time uh, and it usually takes a week or 10 days or so for a particular intervention to embed. So one of the positive things uh, from my perspective from the schools starting back is we have a, a really good clear window now to see, uh, to make sure uh, that what we expect to happen does actually happen and then review. So I think certainly we, we will be looking to keep those timelines as much as we can. And uh, next we turn to Lauren from Tombridge. Hello. With the new roadmap for reopening the country, it was mentioned that all legal limits on social contact will be removed by the 21st of June at the earliest. Does this include the use of masks and PPE indoors? If not, how long do you think this rule will apply? Jenny, if I can turn to you. Um, so I think I go back to the, the points that we've just made about being really clear um, about uh, the impact that different interventions have and these lifting of measures as we go forward. One of the things we know, of course, is that doing things outside is ever so much uh, safer than doing things inside. Uh, ventilation, we know, is really important uh, and uh, fresh air it is uh, it always uh, reduces, if you like, the density of the virus. So uh, outdoors is not so much of an issue, and you'll see that coming through in the, the guidance and the roadmap. Um, I think we have to look at these different interventions, uh, look at the data, as the roadmap says, and check where we are. Um, and I think, uh, as I think Sir Patrick said earlier this week, that as we get into the autumn, uh, when winter comes in and we spend more time inside, then again we may be looking at it, but it's quite possible over summer months, as we did last year when we see rates drop, uh, that we would not need to be wearing uh, masks all that time and uh, obviously PPE, uh, PPE, uh, PPE actually is, is very much for um, clinical use, uh, face coverings uh, clearly is for general use. So I think summer period is generally we think is a much safer period for us with less need for interventions, but I think that doesn't rule it out as we go into winter periods again. And, and as the Secretary of State has said and the roadmap sets out, we have to stick very much to looking at the evidence and then acting on that as we go forward. Uh, next we turn to Branwyn Jeffries from the BBC. Branwyn. Education Secretary, you've provided short-term cash today, but when will you have a long-term plan to help children recover? And you've said just now that if your child needs help, they will get it. Is that a promise that parents can hold you to? So, Branwyn, what we all want to see is we want to see all of our children back into schools. We know that schools are the very best place for uh, all of our children. And as part of this £700 million package that we are rolling out, building on the billion pounds that we announced last year, we're giving schools the tools that they need in order to be able to deliver for all children uh, in that schools. Um, but it is... Uh, it is a real sense and a real belief that we can help all children within the education system. Uh, this is why we've taken such a broad range of measures, but given schools the flexibility in order to be able to uh, sort of make sure that it is properly targeted to the children who need the most help. And in terms of when uh, further details about the more mid-term and long-term reforms that we'll be seeing. Uh, as you'll be well aware, we just uh, pointed to Kevin Collins uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we want to give Kevin a little bit of opportunity, and we're already doing an extensive amount of work in terms of engaging with uh, schools, teachers, parents, and children themselves in terms of looking at what are the next steps to best be able to boost their education and actually come out of this pandemic stronger, bolder, being able to deliver a better and stronger education system for every single one of our children. 
Uh, Branwyn, do you have another question? Just to follow up on that, that point, you, you seem to be promising every parent that if their child needs help, they will get it. Is that a promise they can hold you to? Well, schools have always delivered for all children right across the country, and the reason that we've given such a broad range of tools for schools to be able to bring to bear to help children, whether it is for summer schools, whether it's for targeted uh, tuition, or whether it's for flexibility with the extra £302 million that will be going into school budgets, to be able to craft that to the specific needs. We'd hope that that would be able to meet the needs of all children, uh, whatever their background, in terms of being able to help them catch up. So yes, we're very much supporting all children in our whole school system. Uh, next, if we move to Dan Hewitt at ITV. Dan. Thank you, Education Secretary. Um, two questions. Um, I'm happy if you can answer them yes or no if you want. Um, are school days going to be extended to help up with the catch-up programme? And are summer holidays or could summer holidays be cut short this summer to help children catch up? Uh, so on, um, on the summer holidays, what we've done in terms of a £200 million programme is we're wanting schools to be putting on great activities, whether it's edu uh, education-led or even sort of well-being-led. So we'd be hoping that schools can be offering that, draw down that funding in order to be offer offering that to child children. So yes, we would hope that schools are offering uh, time uh, in schools for children um, and that's why we've put the funding there. In terms of, uh, you ask about lengthening the school days, as part of uh, uh, this plan, it's not a part of a plan in terms of lengthening school days, but as I've touched on in the past, what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to see a real change, a step change in what we can deliver in terms of our schools. That's why we're taking this in-depth look at how do we drive results, how do we drive attainment, how do we drive the... Uh, the chances of youngsters from the most disadvantaged backgrounds. And that's why we've asked Sir Kevin to do this extensive look uh, at education and what reforms, what changes we can bring about. Uh, Dan, I'm not sure if there's a follow-up question. Uh, yeah, well, you mentioned exams earlier, so I'll ask about that. Can we assume then that it's going to be full teacher assessment on exam results this year, no, no algorithms? And how will the appeal process work in that case? Uh, well, as I've uh, said many times before, we're putting our trust in teachers. Uh, that's where the trust is going. There's going to be no algorithms whatsoever, but there'll be a very clear and robust appeals mechanism. But I'm afraid you're going to have to forgive me. Uh, it's right that this is announced to the House of Commons and uh, not to yourself. Um, so sorry about that, Dan, but that will be happening tomorrow. So just a, a few more hours to wait. Um, next, if we can turn to Ben at uh, LBC. Ben. Thank you, Secretary of State. No doubt at all that children have missed out on a huge amount of school, but they've also missed on, out on a huge amount of other elements of uh, normal life. So Secretary of State, can you reassure them today and guarantee that the government will not allow a situation this summer whereby children, young people, others who may have not been vaccinated yet will be prevented from going to the cinema, going out for a meal, going on holiday with their family. And if I could ask uh, Dr. Harris, there's some evidence that the so-called Kent variant infects people for longer than the original strain. 13 days for the Kent variant, one study found, compared to eight for the original COVID strain. They say, the authors of that study, that means that the 10-day quarantine period may need to be lengthened. Is that something you're looking at? And if that did happen, is it your view that more would need to be done to support people financially to quarantine when they need to do so? Thank you. Jenny, would you like to go yes, first? Yes, th thank you for that. So, yes, um, obviously we look at the different variants uh, regularly. We have variants of interest and variants uh, under of concern. Uh, those are being monitored. Uh, you'll be aware that the UK has uh, probably the best genomics uh, uh, functionality uh, in the world and we're contributing actually to world science on that so absolutely watched all the time um, it different studies will come out with slightly different uh, periods and what you will have seen with the original if you like the original um, coronavirus in the UK is that we uh, 
manage the length of time for quarantine to minimise the inconvenience to individuals, but still reduce the risk of onward infection. And so, yes, we are looking at this, but I think we need to be really careful just because, uh, as with the original uh, coronavirus, you can still, uh, the time that you detect the virus doesn't mean necessarily that that is the infectious period. It may be different in others. And of course, at the moment, we are uh, vaccinating really brilliantly across the country. Um, and so we have quite a different mix at the moment of uh, transmission risks who may be at risk so we're just starting to see early signs that those most vulnerable uh, will have uh, less chance of serious uh, disease um, and uh, and we will have to adapt that as we go through but actually every variant will be looked at if it uh, is a significant uh, of transmission risk across the UK. And Ben picking up on the question that you asked me uh, I think as a, a dad myself with uh, two daughters I, I think uh, that uh, the novelty of going for walks with me is starting to run a bit thin now and they want sort of a slightly more enhanced entertainment uh, so I, I, I think from uh, as, as a dad's point of view I'm very desperate to make sure that they're able to uh, enjoy the benefits of opening up uh, society opening up different parts of the economy uh, and uh, being able to get out there so I'm absolutely sure we're not going to be disadvantaging our young people to be able to uh, enjoy the benefits of stepping out into the world so much more than they've been able to. Um, ben, I'm not sure if you've got another question. Uh, please don't feel obliged if you have, uh, if you haven't. There was just a quick thing on relating to what you said earlier. So say, obviously, you're leaving the uh, summer schools question to individual schools. How are you going to make sure that the uh, inequalities in education that we've seen worsen in this period don't worsen still by lack of central coordination over that catch-up program well we, we're really sort of driving the sort of tempo giving the schools resources uh, our regional schools commissioners will be working very closely with local authorities um, uh, multi-academy trusts uh, and uh, individual schools themselves in order to be able to ensure that we have this level uh, and, you know, schools are meeting our expectations in terms of spending this money on uh, interventions that are really going to help children. And it's something that's already Ofsted started to be able to look at and assess and actually giving schools guidance as to how best to be able to, to go forward with this investment that we're making in them. And, of course, the brilliant work of the Education Endowment Foundation, giving very clear guidance about how best we can help but this is part of the reason why we did the National Tutoring Programme as well, Ben, because there's so much evidence based around the fact that it really does drive attainment with children almost more than any other single intervention. And this is uh, a resource that's available to all schools around the country. We want to see them making use of it. It's going to be truly transformational for the lives of hundreds of thousands. Um, next, if we can uh, move to Camilla... Uh, Turner from The Telegraph. Camilla. Thank you. Um, to the Education Secretary, um, William Hague said that the impact of COVID on children will leave the biggest scar of the pandemic and require a revolution in teaching. But how revolutionary are you prepared to be? Would you consider things like smaller class sizes, building more schools and longer terms? And secondly, do you believe the COVID generation's life chances are as good as those from other generations? And to the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, much has been said about the damage to children's education, but what assessment has been made of the damage to their wider development by not being able to play with their friends or see their grandparents? Uh, so, Camilla, if I, I, I take the two questions that you sort of posed me and then hand over to Jenny. Um, we do need to see, um, we always need to have children at the heart of everything that we do. Uh, every intervention, every change that we make to our schooling system has got to be focused on one thing, and that's driving change and improvement in terms of the outcomes that children are going to have. And that's what we've uh, tasked Sir Kevin uh, to do. And there's a number uh, of areas that uh, we need to be looking at. And it is, the, you know, uh, one of those is making sure that we're always driving up the the quality of teaching, making sure that children are getting the very best uh, teaching in the classroom. Also, uh, the second item is looking at the time 
uh, that uh, children are spent actually learning, uh, having the benefit of being able to pick up knowledge. And the third element is making sure that we're targeting uh, children in the best possible way, uh, making sure that those children that need those interventions, that we're delivering on that. It would be wrong of me to try and preempt what uh, Sir Kevin is going to come forward with, but there is a real appetite and a desire to make sure we deliver the absolute most for every single one of our children, but that's going to be based on evidence of what works, um, and what works is going to be what drives us in terms of reforms and changes that we need to deliver for all our changes. And I Coming on to your second point about the life chances of this COVID, uh, you know, children who have been at school during this period of um, this COVID pandemic. You know, as someone who has two daughters at school, I'm absolutely certain that we are going to do everything we can do for all of our children to make sure that they do not, uh, they're not set back by this pandemic, that their life chances are in any way not stinted. We're going to do everything we can do to make sure that they can reach their absolute potential. This is why we're willing to look at every single matter in order to be able to drive their attainment into the future. And we are not going to be timid in terms of, you know, our aspirations for them and the actions that we'll have to take to deliver for them. Uh, Jenny. If... Thank you, Secretary of State. Um, yes, so I think in the same way that face-to-face -face education, we know that missing that uh, has really significant negative impacts on uh, children's cognitive, emotional, uh, academic well-being and on their physical and mental health. And I think it's not, although we naturally think of grandparents, there are many families with entirely different makeups where there are significant other individuals who children attach to and learn from and are really important in their lives that they haven't been able to see. Um, SAGE, so the Scientific Advisory Group on Emergencies, has looked at, particularly at the face-to-face -face, um, uh, children's education uh, risks around that, but generally as well about children's well-being. And we know that mental health has deteriorated for many children. It was uh, rates of referrals for children's mental health had increased anyway in recent years, but certainly uh, it has uh, increased again during the pandemic, which of course is why it's so important that children do go back to school. The, the only caveat I would just say at the moment around um, you know, wanting to go and see your grandparents, which is absolutely natural, uh, is uh, two things. One, the testing programme in schools is clearly going to mean uh, that people, parents, grandparents and teachers and other school children can be very assured that uh, schools will be as safe as they can because we are trying to remove infection from that environment. And of course, that will have a really positive impact on breaking chains of tran transmission in communities and in those families. But the slight caveat to that is having got so far down the line with this and now uh, on the roadmap very, very carefully coming out, uh, I would encourage children not to go off yet, even if their grandparents have had their vaccinations, uh, not to go hugging them too much until we're absolutely sure uh, what the impact of that vaccine rollout has been. I'm sure it's going to be positive, but we just need to uh, take a steady course out through the roadmap. Camilla, I know you managed to get three questions into your first question, but I wasn't sure if you just got one very, one uh, very short one uh, uh, to sort of follow up. Um, yeah, so if, if we, we know that children's education has been massively disrupted and also their mental health has um, taken a huge hit in the past year, um, to the Education Secretary, do you acknowledge that the government's policies over the past year have played a role in this deterioration of children's mental health conditions as well as their academic learning loss? Well, what the government has done is one of, uh, you know, we've got one of the most impressive vaccine rolls out of any major industrial country anywhere in the world. Uh, by taking the, uh, the big decisions that the Prime Minister had to take uh, uh, early last year, uh, when many people were saying they weren't necessary, this has actually created a very clear pathway as how we rebound out of this. And of course, as you all know, Camilla, I always want to see children in schools all the time because, you know, I see the value that they get, I see the pleasure that they get. Uh, but we know that there are, there have been, um, you know, children not being in school 
uh, is something that we never want to see. And obviously children um, do lose out as a result of that. And that's why we've got the you know, uh, £700 million package today in terms of rolling out to, to schools to support them. And we're looking at uh, very much solutions that support a child and help a child uh, really succeed in the future. And that's the work that we're currently undertaking and we're certainly going to deliver on. Um, next, if I can go to Will Hazel at VI. Will. Uh, my first question is on the twice weekly home COVID testing, uh, which secondary school people, how are you actually going to make sure that they do that? And would you like to take this opportunity for, uh, to ask parents uh, to check uh, that they're doing that each week? Um, and then secondly, um, on summer schools. Um, who's actually going to start these uh, classes um, over the holidays? And would you like uh, to see teachers actually take some time out of their holidays to help run those? Well, on, on the second point in terms of summer schools, the reason that we've given schools the uh, additional resource is that uh, they're then in a position to be able to uh, pay existing staff, bring new staff in, uh, be able to properly uh, resource these schools and give a sort of a high quality um, support for, for children that come in there. So it's really about the flexibility of what works for the school, but most importantly, what will be working best for the children within that school if that school t decides to draw down on that funding. And in terms of a twice weekly testing, yes, I very much would hope that uh, parents would be there to support the children in doing this. Uh, we're seeing over the first two weeks of school's return uh, we'll be seeing in that first two weeks uh, uh, children doing the tests but being supervised uh, as part of that so they properly learn the process about how to do it and but that's you know following on from that that twice weekly testing regime I certainly hope that parents will be uh, encouraging and supporting uh, children in doing that but we're also asking uh, schools to keep open a asymptomatic testing centre so if children uh, haven't been able to get the support or the help that maybe they need uh, to do the test at home uh, it's possible to do the test in school as well. Um, I'm not sure if anything on testing um, and so, just to add to that, I think the, the way that NHS Test and Trace have set this up, it is important that those tests are reported back, um, and for 18-year-olds and above, uh, that's obviously an, an independent um, uh, process. For 12 to 17-year-olds, as the Secretary of State has said, then uh, that is uh, an adult overseen process. But I think it's really important people understand these are very, very simple things to do. Many of the public are doing this now if they perhaps go into work or if they're a healthcare worker. Um, and in fact, what's being uh, set up for schools and for staff in schools is very similar to what happens for healthcare workers. So I think staff can be particularly assured that that same sort of testing, spacing and approach uh, is there for them and for their pupils. So I think inherently uh, safer environments in schools as we go forward with, the, with this additional uh, testing mechanism. Uh, and, and Will, to add, we've obviously seen uh, testing uh, rolled out since January across uh, education settings. It's been taken up uh, with enormous enthusiasm. Uh, we've also seen the rollout of home testing in terms of workforce and the reporting back on this has been incredibly positive with uh, you know, one of the highest rates of return of any workplace setting uh, being uh, within schools. So uh, the in, all the initial indications are uh, it's been an enthusiastic embracing uh, of uh, self-testing and we look forward to seeing that expanded further. Uh, Will, I'm not sure if you'd got a, a quick follow-up question or if there's anything else. Just, just a quick, if I may, um, it's on the for uh, secondary school pupils to wear in the classroom. Um, in August, Boris Johnson's children wearing masks uh, in classes was nonsensical. Um, and that you can't expect to learn with face coverings. Um, I was just wondering uh, if you agree with them. So we've always said, Will, all the way through this, is that we'll always follow the best scientific, medical and health advice. And when we uh, have that uh, advice come forward, uh, that's obviously uh, quite rightly the 
the advice that we follow. Uh, Jenny, I'm not sure if there's yes. anything you want to say on the wearing of face masks. I, I will actually, because I think for, uh, earlier on in the uh, broadcast when uh, I was talking to Lauren, uh, I was speaking very general terms, and obviously this is very about face coverings and their use. So I think we need to be very clear about face masks and PPE, which is for clinical use. Obviously, face coverings are there to help others. We're protecting others by wearing them. Um, and there are a number of different conditions at the moment. So, for example, we have a new variant, and while we are understanding that more, um, then obviously taking additional precautions uh, makes sense. We understand more about the um, ability for aerosol uh, generation and transmission. Uh, so that is also important. So things, I think, have moved on, and uh, it should be reassuring to know that we look at the evidence and then uh, adjust our advice accordingly. But I think also one of the uh, things here, if, if testing is coming into place in schools, um, and uh, we, uh, we will see, but it's very likely that we will find a, a few cases, and there will be uh, some children do have to stay at home, unfortunately, for a short period at the start of term. But then over time, uh, what will happen is those uh, school environment should be free, more or less free of infection. Um, and at that point, as the Secretary of State has said previously, around Easter time, then obviously that is another issue to consider. It is important. Many children uh, can't communicate well, um, particularly small children, which is why this hasn't been uh, suggested for primary schools. Um, and, and really important to understand that any child or any uh, adult or, or other pupil helping them who, who needs to be able to uh, be seen to communicate effectively, uh, then there are exemptions for this, just as there are uh, for our general uh, use of face coverings in public. Thank you, Will. Uh, next and finally, we move on to Amy Gibbons from the Times Educational Supplement. Thank you. Education Secretary, are you worried that teachers' faith in your department has plummeted to the point where 96% lack trust in your handling of the pandemic? Uh, well, Amy, thanks ever so much for uh, coming uh, to ask a question. What we're focused on is making sure that all children are back into school at the, the, the right time and the best possible moment. That's going to be the 8th of March. Uh, we know that children benefit uh, most of all from being in school. We know that uh, children need to be in school in terms of not just their education, but their mental health and their their. Their, their development, and that is why our focus is making sure that uh, they are back in school on the 8th of March, and it's something that I know so many teachers are also very keen to see because they want to be welcoming their children as well. Well, I'd like to take the opportunity to say thank you everyone for tuning in, and thank you for all you're doing to make sure everyone in the nation is safe. Thank you. <laughs>